Christian Parenting. Welcome to the Living Wholehearted Podcast. We are Jeff and Tara Matson, a husband and wife team who is shrinking the integrity gap in our own lives and helping others do the same. I'm a leadership and organizational development coach, and Tara is a licensed marriage and family therapist. We believe that if you have a following, you are a leader and how you lead matters. Whether you are leading in the home, work, or community, we are bringing you biblical, clinical, and relational wisdom to help you in every relationship that matters most to you. None of us do this perfectly, but we are leaning into the reality of our humanity and profound wisdom of grace. of raising a girl of today's world feels daunting, which is why I'm so grateful for my wife, Tara Matson, and the Helping Moms Raise Confident Daughters courses through from Christian Parenting. In these courses, you'll be guided through eight monthly one-on-one dates and intentional conversations to deep your, deepen your relationship with each other while you help your daughter grow in confidence. When you purchase your course, you'll be equipped with monthly videos to help you understand exactly where your daughter is spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. You'll also get a conversational guide to deepen your relationship during your set one-to-one dates and a downloadable journal to create and strengthen a connection with your daughter through the month. The best part is that there's a course for every age. So no matter what stage your daughter is in, you can have the tools to build a safe and trusted relationship where she knows you can listen and talk about the real issues concerning her. Well, we have a key role uh, to play in shaping how our daughters view themselves and their stories. I know these courses will help you and your desire to raise a confident, godly daughter. So register for your right course today. Visit cpguides.org to select your course today. That's cpguides.org. Well, every so often, Jeff and I hop on here and just have a conversation about different things that we are working through in our own stories or we're walking through with our clients, both in the counseling and the coaching spaces, um, or just things that we are engaging with as we're um, working with organizations and leaders throughout the country. And today we thought we'd talk about um, our concept around living out of our priorities and what concentric circles can really do in, in helping us align Um, our integrity, shrink the gap between who we say we are and how we actually live. Yeah, that's right. The concentric circles, and we kind of put that together for us as a sort of a way of life, a way of living. Um, And, uh, you know, there are other models that are out there for ordering life and living. This is just one that just came out of organically out of uh, what we felt God was calling us to do and uh, for our own prioritization. So it, uh, it's a simple model and it's, you can just imagine concentric circle starts with an inner circle and then there's a circle that goes outside of that and you continue to put other circles and you fill in spaces. Um, and the, the idea is, is, is that the inner circles uh, are the most important, the priorities, right? And so it's from inner to outer. And it's not that the outer circles don't have priority. If they're actually on on the list, if you will, that shows that they're a priority. Um, But there's things that we don't put on that, uh, on this. And it allows us to, to, uh, in choices in life and in living day to day. I mean, literally it's like, hey, we get a phone call from somebody that says, you guys want to come over tonight for dinner? We look at where that friendship might be in our order of circles. And we consider, hey, how is that going to impact the inner circles before we make decisions on I stuff just, like that? I uh, just was thinking like, oh, great. Everyone's wondering where they where they lie on the center of the circle when you ask us over for dinner. Did we make the cut? Oh, that's funny. Well, um, that those concentric circles are coming out of a massive problem. So let's describe the problem yeah. that just all of us um, in humanity struggle with, but particularly those high capacity leaders who are the people that get asked to do all kinds of things because they're good at that, they're good at it, or they can, mm-hmm. or they're just yes people and they're they're game for uh, living life to the fullest. So and maybe they even also collect a lot of people. So some, I might have pe- that problem. Some people are good at that, and so your people group is huge, and it's just like a, a math problem. Actually, mm-hmm. I literally cannot have dinner with. Five people on the same night. <laughs> so. Well, I think the research says that you can only um, emotionally attune mm-hmm. and have intimate relationships with up to 64 
four people. Like in your whole life, In right? your whole life. And so when you start to think about social media, that magnifying the engagement from certain influencers and the way that we want to engage those in our spheres. So, so social media changed that platform for everybody. But then you think about leaders, you know, you've got maybe you are mentoring um, or you're leading a church or you've got an organization of 500 employees. Um, you've got your family, your cousins, maybe you come from a big family um, and you've got, you know, 50 cousins that you're trying to keep up with. And then they all have babies. Things um, get complicated. Then you have your neighbors yeah. and you have your church community. Um, it just multiplies. And then you have your college friends, your high school friends, uh, the friends that you met on your kid's softball team. It just starts adding up. And the introverts are having a heart attack right now. <laughs> starting to hyperventilate as they think about, uh, no thanks. And those of us that are maybe more on the extroverted side kind of say, bring nope. it on. Well, but you also know the struggle too, you yes. know, when it gets to be too much. And that's, yeah. So, I mean, this is a really, that's the problem is, is, uh, um, accepting, uh, having a sense of reactionary, um, um, a mindset as opposed to being proactive. Uh, and it, Ultimately, you're, if you're living in that reactionary space, uh, that's why you feel stress and anxiety probably more often not than being more proactive about this. So to reduce anxiety and stress about who we say yes to and uh, who we say no to and what we say yes to and no to, th this order allows us to give uh, us a chance to just quickly do a quick intake as to how outer circles could impact inner circles. And, um, and it gives the freedom that you actually want to have, all of us want to have, to be able to say yes to things that matter the most, no to things that maybe don't, and be okay with that. Yeah. And I think really the, the bigger issue, which we write about in our book, Shrinking the Integrity Gap, is, is that a lot of leaders will give their all to the masses, right? They're making an impact for Jesus, for kingdom, for profit, whatever their call and their passion is. And at the end of the day, when they uh, maybe see their children face to face as adults, we've sat with too many children, adult children, who look back and say, Hey, mom and dad, you were amazing. You did all these great things, but I wasn't in the picture. You gave your time and your energy away um, to others uh, before me. And, and we hear that with spouses, we hear that with uh, children. And so this proactive approach um, comes really from my own personal story and my own real passion to say, I want to be a helper and I want to help uh, and live out the call that I have on my life to be a, a ministry of reconciliation, helping people restore their relationship with God, themselves and others. And yet I don't want to do that at the cost uh, where my girls look at me and say, hey, mom, you did awesome helping everybody else. Um, but or me, or me, or you. <laughs> Hello. I feel Hello, like <laughs> <my chaplain. laughs> I feel like your voice is louder in my life. But I think kids, if for moms and dads, kids don't always know any different until they get out in the world and they go, "Wait a minute, uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I always felt like I got the leftovers." Well, um, that's what we say. We say it this way. It's kind of a, a phrase that might help, kind of hit you between the eyes. We say, um, you know, why is it that we give some of the best of what we've mm -hmm. got to those we would never say? we love the most. So what we want to do is you want to save some of the best that you have in your energy, in your uh, heart, and in your desires for those that you love the most. At work, it's conserving resources. Uh, whether you're at work or you're um, at home, uh, full-time with kids, saving some of the best that you love for those, saving some of the best uh, for those you love the most is hard. And it actually takes attention. It won't happen if you just sort of wing it, right? Which is when we've winged it, we know it's it's apparent. Either when one of us or it. both of it. <laughs> when we wong it. <laughs> okay, so going back to the concentric circles, which is the tool. It's just a tool, right? And so let's talk through. We'll, we'll talk through a case study, which probably could fit a majority of our clients, but. Maybe talk, walk through a process that you might sit with one of your um, executive leadership mm -hmm. clients mm -hmm. and say, okay, we're going to use this concentric circles. What might you do? Um, asking them to do some homework and then start processing together. Well, I, I did it recently with a client and uh, he's a very successful individual. Uh, he's uh, in charge of, um, you know, has his own company in finance and uh, yet struggling in relationship. Uh, with his wife and with his kids right now. And what I challenged him to do was I challenged him, I said, it's appealing to the work that he does with excellence. 
I thought I would love to have you um, imagine that you were hired uh, to, to take this responsibility, this assignment. You were hired as an independent auditor for a, you're a Fortune 100 company. So this is a big deal. You, you're gonna, this is a big job. And as that mindset, you're going to sit down and you're going to draw out some empty circles, right? Inner and then outer and outer and outer, right? And as an independent auditor, you're going to examine your own life based on how you spend your time, your energy, and your finances. I want you to fill out the circles. Who belongs in those circles? So you're thinking about work. You're thinking about your spouse. You're thinking about your kids. You're thinking about friends. You're thinking about your relationship with God. Um, and you, with honesty and integrity, as an independent auditor, based on those three categories, you're going to fill out these circles. And then what I challenged them to do was I said, after that, you and God having conversations about what, what is down in that paper, side by side now, Fill out the ideal circles, if you will, with God guiding you and directing you. And if you need help, I'm here with you. And so uh, what, we've, what we argue for, we believe is pretty clear that there's actually three categories that, that God designed for us if we are married and have kids. Uh, and there's some adjustment to that if you're not married and you don't have kids. But um, that he orders and says needs to be in this order. This is a fixed order in the first three circles. And uh, circles outside of that, a lot of freedom. So what is, that, what is those first three circles? If, uh, no matter if you're married or, or have kids or not, the first circle for all of us, we believe in, from a scriptural stance and understanding of the biblical worldview and God's heart for us as his creation, it should be God and me. Inner circle. He says there should be no more God, no other gods but me, and, and that's and that means I can't place anything, even though that's hard. Oh my gosh, I can't place anything above my relationship with Him and above Him. He needs to be first. Now, if you're also married, then the second circle, from our understanding of Scripture, has the most important relationship that should not come before God, but after God, right after that is your spouse and it should be your spouse and me. And then after that, if you have, if you're married and you have kids, it should be your children, your primary ministry. And after that comes lots of freedom. <laughs> and you might put your work, you might put your ministry, you might put, uh, you might put extended family and so on and so forth. And there's a, there's a lot of freedom for how we do this. But we have found over a couple decades of working with leaders behind the closed doors of coaching and leadership and organizational work, whether they're people who are of faith or not, or and behind the closed doors in counseling in the clinical space, whether we're working with clients that are people who are of faith or don't share that biblical worldview, that most of their troubles have come from getting those first three circles out of order, especially if they are again married and have kids. And if they don't have a marriage or kids, then of course, God in me is still the first. And behind that, there's freedom after that for them in that space as to how they would order that. Yeah. And before we start getting into the practical house, um, I want to just tease that out a little bit. The, the center circle is God and me. And that really is about our identity and how often we can try to shove our children in the middle of that and they don't belong in there. They're not about, they're not, they don't define who we are. And so you can get that priority in the concentric circles where you've made your whole world about your kids or your whole world about your spouse or your whole world about work or your whole world about um, your church ministry and that's shoved in the middle, but that's not who we are. Exercise, entertainment, yeah, throw so, anything, throw anything in, in there that can infringe on this. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really about our identity. And so we start to think a little bit more about what grows, what helps me feel more intimate with God, what helps me slow down and to really be in tune with his grace and his um, love for me. And that sense of peace and steadfastness. So those are the rhythms that we talk about maybe in church culture a lot. Those are the, the things that help us rest, help us to be able to be attuned with his word um, and, and, and having structure around that Sabbath. Um, Connected being, to him. Yeah. He says in the scriptures that remain in me and I in you. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Yes, exactly. John 15. Yeah. yeah. And, and so then, that's the spirit of it, right? It's 
out of that, out of that headwaters, and God created us like in that, and we see throughout Scripture, Mm -hmm. Old and New Testament, it's about abiding in Him, trusting in God. It's about connecting with Him. And out of that, then we have the proper perspective. If we are believing in who He says He is, and we are believing what He says, who He says we are, then we can actually um, see our spouse Uh, the way in which he is asking us to see them if we're married and our kids and how he's asking us to see and develop and shepherd them. If we, and everything else, all the circles behind that, if we don't have this inner circle correct, then we're always going to be out of alignment. And that's why we feel stress and anxiety and frustrated so much of the time and And feel like things aren't working. This isn't a one and done. Mm -hmm. Like this is an assessment. I think what that process that you did with your client and what we do over and over and over, whether it's in our cohorts or with our coaching or um, sometimes just even in our own life, it's an examination process. It's an ability to slow down and go, okay, what's the gap between what, how I'm actually living and what do I really want to be about? Um, So it's not a shame process. Mm -hmm. It's just um, health, true health is Mm -hmm. actually living in reality. And so being able to take a look at the reality of where our time and our energy is going. And so that relationship with God, it's not necessarily like we need to all be monks and pull away. <laughs> um, right. But So we're going to have people in our life. We have work to do. We have uh, dishes and, and um, jobs and careers. But that it's a really a heart posture, I yeah. think, yeah. and really making sure we're starting and ending our, our identity at that place with God um, and who he is in our life. So if if we don't have a faith with him, then it's it's a journey of moving towards that and figuring out who you are and um, maybe being curious about what God might say about you. And if you do have a relationship with God, it's just always that good place to go, hmm, where am I at in my um, time and energy and resources with my building my intimacy with God? And then I would move out to you, Jeff, my spouse, to say, hey, I really love you. I haven't really seen you or talked to you in about four days <laughs> because I've been so busy. I should probably close that gap a little bit. So it's a good way of me assessing, have I saved time? Am I saving energy to be willing to connect with you? I have one example of a client who she's actually an introvert. Husband is an extrovert. He uses all his time at work with all the people that he's with and he leads. And she uses her little bit of people part, um, the merchant, what we call in the core values, with the people she serves in her job. And so when they come home, they got nothing left for each other. She wants to go curl up on the couch and be alone and doesn't want anyone around her. And he is tapped um, as well and has no merchant to draw that out in her And so we've been talking about how do we move towards this concentric circle where you're saving what you're giving to all your outer circles, Mm -hmm. moving that towards and being very intentional about how you're setting up your work day Mm -hmm. so that you have some margin at the end of the day to actually want to talk to your spouse. Or maybe it's just one day a week that there's that intentional um, using your words. So in this case, it wasn't a gender thing. It's a wiring thing. Mm -hmm. Um, In my client experience, what I was doing was is that... um, I would then, after they had this experience of taking this honest inventory about their order of circles, and then we would have them fill out putting in God and them, God and me, spouse and me, and kids and me, and then filling out the other items that, you know, prayerfully should go in the order that they felt God was talking then to them about where those priorities needed to be. It was a process then of calling that person to to kind of a confession and a repentance in this and to walking with them. And so this is an important thing. How do you do this? Having somebody that you can have that would walk Mm -hmm. alongside you in this process. It might be a friend and a mentor. could be your pastor if uh, if you have a relationship in that space. Or you hire a coach. You hire somebody to do this kind of a work with you, right? Um, Now it's in this process that the challenge was in their own relationship with God. And by the way, for this individual, God wasn't even on their list, in their circle, on their first. And that was honest respect for the truth in that space. And and in the ideal circle. But they're a profession Christian. So they just, that's the reality of it. And this is, this person is working on closing their integrity gap, like all of us can and Mm -hmm. desire to. So it was being able to be that honest about the fact that God wasn't even on the list of circles. 
and uh, and to have to to have them have this conversation and to help them to have this conversation with God of just feeling the feels about this and there's remorse and there was and to talk with God about that and to talk with another person about it confession is so powerful as we mm-hmm. understand confession the scriptures are clear confess that you may be healed and and that is the process we know the neuroscience supports that principle which is awesome but we uh, that's that's the why behind having someone go through this with you and then the challenge is and it, they haven't I, uh, I don't know that they've done this yet, but this is the assignment. It says that out of that spirit of confession and repentance, and repentance is a commitment to turning away. That's not like you flip on a switch and all of a sudden, hey, he's living in the circles, the <laughs> ideal circles, or that I, I would be able to do that. No, this is a journey, as you described. This is a, a, and you will recommit ourselves throughout our life as we go through the highs and lows of life. And as it, it, it's not something that it's a one and done, as you said. So, to then go to his people, first and foremost, to his wife, and then to his and to his kids, to share share this with them about how they haven't been living in the order um, that it, that that keeps them in their inner circles, to confess and to repent from in, with them, and to say that this is a commitment that they're going to be making, and over the course of the rest of their days, going to be continuing to try to align with these priorities as God's given them direction. Now, is there freedom in the other, again, the outer circles outside of, to, to change the priorities in different seasons? Of course, but not a freedom to change these first three circles for a person who's a follower of God, for a person who is married and who has kids. Um, and so it, this provides great clarity. Now, I, I'll be on the edge of my seat waiting to see if that happens for this client in this space and what it could do to begin a reset in their family system, in their lives. So now the working phase of that, so there's an assessment process, there's a confession and that sense of readiness to, to turn and go a different way. But then that process is where us coaches help uh, a client really work through practical action steps. Um, it's a pruning process. Oh, where do I need, what do I need to let go of? What do I need to say no to? What do I need to close up a commitment and not re-engage that? Where do I need to open up and grab? So I just did this with a client. We walked through concentric circles and she was just realizing that her uh, center with her and God, she had room for everybody else, her husband, her kids, her entire staff that she cared for, but there just wasn't much for her. And so we said, let's grab every white space, anything that's wide open the, from now till the end of the year, go and grab it, just open it up. And that is for you and the Lord. And you do not get to say yes to anything else that comes your way and schedule in. And that's going to be a hard challenge for her because she's been a yes pleaser, people pleaser for so many years. But that's a first action step, a, a step that will help grow muscles and will be an ongoing practice. But there's a shifting that happens over time in that working phase that can take anywhere up to a year to two years to start learning to turn your life back towards the right side of those circles. And then then we have to maintain it. That's this final place of like, what are the the rhythms and the environments that I need to to create so that I can maintain it? And I would say that a couple of things about the maintaining piece, right? First, there's, it's, it can be really fun, actually, mm-hmm. um, once you get into a space where you, are, again, are tuning to the people that are in your inner circles, and you're doing this from a space like, I, I want to get better at this. And so then it be, when you're in, engaging in the direction and ordering, following God's order for, for, for living in your inner circles, He gives you great joy and energy. You begin to experience some of those fruits of His Spirit to be able to um, take ground in this. It's like a whole new frontier for some people. And it's such a wonderful journey of discovery, right? So here's what that looks like. Let's just say that I'm trying, I've, let's say my client, let's say I'm that person, right? And I have just confessed and re- I have repentance to you and to our daughters for living not in order of these circles and a commitment I want to make to take ground in in placing you in my second circle and our girls in our third. Mm -hmm. How do I, how am I going to do that? Well, I would probably start by talking with you after I've been talking with God, asking God for ideas as to how practical 
Yeah. I can honor the fact that you are my number two person. God first, you're my number two. And what does that look like in this season of our lives, Tara? And I will ask you. Are you asking me right now? (laughs) Well, there you go. Yeah. So what might that look like? How could I show you in a way that you would see it from a mile away? as me valuing in this season of our life, you as my second most important priority in my whole life. Yeah, I appreciate that and being able to invite those people and you could even move that even further out the circles when you start to assess that with your work and your team. Um, Even as organizational leaders and founders, I have a concentric circles for my team and who gets access to me, who gets my time. The closer in on the circle, you get more of that. The further out, you don't. And so that is something that I have to ask even of my um, Mm -hmm. staff at times to say, what do you need more of of me here? This is the time and energy I want to give you and what do you need? So I love that. So it's not a guessing game and it invites the people. Now, the counselor and me, I'm going to put the hat on for a second. Now, I imagine that if this couple or this client had been married, let's say 20 plus years, there might be some baggage here. And so to just show up to your spouse who has maybe been feeling for years neglected, not prioritized, and all of a sudden you've had a change of heart. A revelation. <laughs> a revelation because of this great coach, Jeff Matson. Um, you know, so so I, I think I want to just say in cautiousness yeah. and and recognizing that just because you come to someone with repentance and saying, I'm ready to change, mm-hmm. that they have a work to in their own heart, that it might not be as easy as them offering a bunch of ideas. It might actually be opening the door to some further dialogue around how you hurt them and wounded them. Um, you might not get the excited response you need. So I just want to lay us in some reality there. Yeah, there's a place where you might have to repair. Yeah. Um, and doing repair before you can start moving towards this new normal. Oh, 100%. And, you know, people might be receiving this at, at different places in their journey. Totally. Some, some might be in a space where they're, they've done repair work already and they're just realizing, my gosh, um, I have been living outside of my concentric, of my circles, my out of my priorities here for two weeks and I'm feeling it. And I, yeah. and, and oh, that's great. there, there may not be a whole lot to kind of go through or hash right. out, but for others, like you said, absolutely. So no matter where you are at, I think that it is a good thing to ask the other person in your circles. And I've done this with our daughters, yes. um, in our, in the third circle, they know that I'm working, that they know because I've not only spoken this, but I, I show this in my behaviors that they don't come before you. As much as I love them, they don't come before you. You're talking to me, not the audience. That's, <laughs> is it getting hot in here right now? <laughs> I don't come before, or the girls Our don't come girls before don't your come spouse, before yeah. their mom. And they, they've heard me say that. I think I've modeled that in our life. Uh, and I'm continuing to work on that mm. because it's tricky. And sometimes they, I, I have, I have admittedly felt greater love for them in moments when I'm annoyed. At you. <laughs> <laughs> what? You Anybody out me? there ever? I mean, that? that's a common struggle. And that for where would be, yeah. I could uh-huh. begin if I let that seed They're grow more fun where my kids with. begin to take the place and fringe on the second circle. They don't belong there. Mm. They don't belong there. And I have to and stay in step with God's spirit as he's reminding me of what is healthy and good. Yeah. Not just for me, not just for us, but for them, our girls. A lot of dysfunction happens when, as you can imagine, when yeah. kids are, are in the wrong circle. Yeah, yeah they feel the too much the wrong responsibility yeah. and it, it feels almost incestuous in a weird way. That's not what, what we're saying, but there's an emotional uh, baggage that kids can't hold when they're put into that second tier. I want to say one of the, Okay, if people are thinking as a, let's say that they're the, a leader in their, in their workspace, right? We spend most of our waking hours at work if you, are, if you have work in that space. And if you work from home, if you're a single parent uh, or you're a, the parent that's taking care of kids and raising kids at home, mm-hmm. that's like your work, right? We spend most of our waking hours at work. So in the order of concentric circles, when I gave that assignment on the amount of time and energy and money, I literally am not saying, my gosh, um, you know, that, uh, that, that work in any way, that's where I would spend probably most of my time. I might spend most of my energy at work and that somehow we've got to reverse that so that you're spending most of your time and energy with you and God. Uh, and, and you suck at work. And it, or you and your spouse and your kids. No, it's, it's the spirit of what we're talking about right. here. It's the who takes the priority. 
Now, and what does that look like? It looks like this. It looks like, I mean, you just ask anybody if they were at work and they got a phone call and, and from, their, from a friend who said your wife's been in a car accident, you're leaving work. Are you not? Of course. And, you know, or something happens to your kids. You're, you're leaving work. You're leaving entertainment. You're leaving the ball game if you, if you got a phone call like that, right? That's what we're talking about here. We're also talking about how you give and the deposits that you contribute in these relationships in the day-to-day, not just the emergencies. Yeah. So let me bring it down, not from an accident, but like your daughter's in a play And you're not really into theater at all, but she is. And she really wants you. This is, she's 10 years old. You know, she's not going to be on Broadway, but this is an important moment for her. You have a really important business um, client that you had scheduled. What do you do? Your daughter really wants you there. And you, she has made every cue and telling you how excited she is to show you what she's been preparing. And inside, you might be also feeling like, oh, well, my work provides for my family. So I'm like, uh, this is also for my daughter. Yeah. Yeah, And she doesn't understand how important this client is. I mean, those are the moments where you have to choose. Mm -hmm. And those are the moments where our integrity that shrinking the gap between what we say, I love my daughter more than I love that client or my work. These are the moments. And so they're very, they're small moments. You'll hear, you'll hear the Holy Spirit pulling on you. Um, and the more that we attune to this, the easier it gets like any other muscle where you just go, it's a given. But when you've been so used to reacting and responding to the needs of the cultural needs, the work needs, the demands on our lives, um, and missing out on the voices that matter the most, our spouse and our kids, um, our walk with God, and even our inner circle of friends and family, even before the outer circle, um, the larger your wake of influence, the harder this gets. Yeah. So this is also a side tangent note to those who are younger emerging leaders to recognize that the large your weight grows, the the more your influence grows, the harder this becomes. So be thoughtful about practicing this early on. Get used to these rhythms. Yeah. These muscles grow strong early at this time. You're going to do this better later. Doesn't mean it'll be easy, but you'll do it better. And those of us who are just now learning in the more seasoned leadership places, uh, it's just a little harder. It's just like starting to work out after not working out at all for decades. So it just takes time but we can get there and we get there faster and better when we've got a coach. And that's what we love to do is to come alongside in these confidential spaces and to help you take those steps towards greater wholeness. Yeah. Because we, we aren't, we aren't like changed by knowledge dump, right? I mean, we're changed by experiences. That's the practice, neuro, that's yeah. the neuroscience and, and the practice. You were just revisiting the fact that to, to form new habits, it's 21 days. Is that 21 right? Days, 21 yeah. days of, of, of new habits. And so Here's how great that is, right? No matter where you are at and when you're hearing this, um, you can you can grow and you can make a decision through the proper confession, repentance as it relates to your relationship with God and how he wants you to order your life. He created us. He's the potter. The scriptures say we are the clay. We don't tell the potter how to shape us and to mold us. We receive his voice for us, his instructions for us, and we need to live within his design in that space. As we do this, we can change our habits. We can we can try new things. We can experience this. And once we su- are submitted to him properly, God, and then we follow his designs, we can get to start. And that's where it is mm-hmm. joyful and exciting. And we're going to fumble it up. Oh my gosh, it's there's moments of just awkward, you know, awkwardness in trying something new and it not gone so well. And this is where we need each other and the commitments of relationships and grace for one another. Um, in our um, in our successes and in our failings, try emphasizing the successes, the efforts that people are putting uh, in our inner circles towards helping to live with greater congruency and keeping these priorities and uh, and graciousness when we know. Yes, good word. Well, if you're curious about how to get a hold of this concentric circle model, it's pretty simple. You can draw it on a piece of paper. But if you needed to check it out and you want a visual, you can go to our book, Shrinking the Integrity Gap. You can get it anywhere books are sold. And you'll see in the addendum, there is a concentric circle there for you as we walk through this in several of our chapters. You can also visit livingwholehearted.com where you'll learn more about our resources and the things that we do from executive coaching, professional counseling to our wholehearted leadership cohorts and retreats and more. 
you can find a free download on that website when you join our newsletter. We'll hand that to you and you can start working on that. And so we're so grateful that you're on this journey of becoming a more wholehearted leader. Until next week, be the leader you would follow. This podcast is powered by Living Wholehearted, Courageous Girls, and the Christian Parenting Podcast Network. Thank you for joining us in this critical movement of shrinking our integrity gaps between what we preach and live.